guys hear me without this? Yeah? Okay, I'm going to go without this. Um, so, correction, I don't work for the Innovation Authority. I work for the Israel Innovation Institute. We're a nonprofit funded by various government sources. What I do is I work with health organizations and healthcare MNCs. Uh, in Israel, live with globally in the process of identifying and defining their challenges and needs, and then defining what a solution looks like, and then matching to the most appropriate technological solution. Um, that's in short. So I have spent a lot of the last three years. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah? So I have spent a lot of the last three years thinking about dissecting, assessing, analyzing, arguing about everything relating to digital health. Um, and over the last three years, I've seen quite a lot of advance, uh, specifically regarding the technology, um, the clinical aspects, um, a lot of wonderful things. But there's one aspect that I continuously find to be unfortunately misunderstood and underrepresented, which is the business of digital health, meaning who's going to pay for this crap and why. So fortunately, in my small pool of people that I think really get it in Israel, we have these four to share with us. Um, so just some rules. I'm gonna moderate you guys. Um, each conversation that I throw out is gonna be followed with some discourse between all of us relating to a specific topic. I'm gonna to try to keep things speedy and on topic um, because I really wanna leave time at the end for questions. I'm hoping there will be. Um, but last, if you guys I lay stuff out on your table, if you could flip it over and pass it around to everybody. Uh, we're gonna play a little digital health bingo. They have no idea that this is happening. <laughs> so whenever one of the panelists mentions one of the things, mark it off, write the initials of who's speaking. Um, one caveat, not me, right? Because I know it's there. <laughs> so, except for me, the winner gets to last gets to ask the last question. So this is a tool to keep you guys engaged and on point. Is that all right with everyone? Okay. So very quickly, um, please give a brief intro. Go. Okay. Also. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me and all of us here. It's a pleasure sitting in this room and with these talented uh, individuals. Um, as mentioned, I'm a physician by background, um, actually a mechanical engineer by background from the uh, Intelligence Corps Technological Unit, spent several years there. Uh, then went to med school, afterwards by a uh, great coincidence found myself in venture capital, worked uh, for AxelMed for years, um, and then found my way back into the clinical world, uh, worked as an internalist, Trombon, uh, also did business development work there. Uh, and from Rambam, I came to Claudit. I've uh, been with Claudit for the past year, um, doing business development work, mainly with our hospitals, and also doing research in public health. Some sort of um, a theme which resonates with my uh, business development work. Hi, everyone. Uh, my background is mostly in bioinformatics and uh, data wizardry. Who are you? Your name is? My name is Nadal Khan. Yet. Um, again, again, I'm going to repeat what you said and uh, say it was, uh, it's great being here. Uh, so I was saying mostly bioinformatics and uh, data wizardry, did my PhD at UC Davis. Uh, a lot of experience leading uh, software development teams and corporates and startups. I founded four different companies, two of which uh, crashed and burned miserably, and two were actually mildly successful. I joined Venture Capital about four years ago. I've uh, been part of Pride Ventures for about a year now. Uh, bringing a lot of data capabilities to, to uh, as part of the team. And I'm gonna tell you a little more about it uh, as we go along because we try to use a lot of data tools within the fund, which I think is very interesting, uh, also for entrepreneurs uh, when they engage with VCs. Hi, I'm Gabby, and uh, data doesn't really matter to me. Past, I think, which is founding the Medtech Innovation Center in Ranana. That was actually a, an initiative that came from the Biogrid Forum, 
by the way. Um, and we made it into a, an actual business, and now it's run by my, uh, my, my uh, Alisa, who I think you probably know. Um, I joined Accenture uh, in January, and I lead the health technology activity for their Ventures Fund. Uh, my focus is on clients in Europe and Latin America, um, and I work with both health providers, payers, and also life sciences companies. So um, I'm now with the corporate side of things with more of a, a larger startups and, and providers and solutions that, um, that are in the market. Um, in my background, I have a master's in arts administration um, and I worked in nonprofit arts. I actually managed the free Shakespeare on the Boston Commons. So if anyone was in Boston and saw Shakespeare for free, I was probably behind that a few years ago. Uh, when I came back to Israel, um, my father, who's sitting right there, Pablo, which I think a lot of you know, um, one of the founders of MedTech in Israel, said to me, why don't you join my practice? And I said, are you kidding? I work in the arts, <laughs> music, theater. And he said, well, you learn business, right? And you worked in nonprofit business in the US, which means you actually know how to do business development, which was true. Um, and he mentored me into MedTech, and I've been working in the medical field for a bit over 10 years now. Um, and fortunately, in this uh, pathway, I've learned about go-to-market um, in medtech. And fortunately, also, I'm uh, uh, H200, Shimon time uh, background, uh, which helped me understand the technology. Um, so I have a bit of digital, a bit of nonprofit, a bit of medical, um, and I think it helps me understand uh, creative business models, which is a little bit what we need to talk about right here in digital health. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be invited to be on this panel. I thank you, David, for you. Um, and uh, I'm also part of the Phi Executive Forum uh, Management Committee, and so I'm really happy that you're all here, and I hope to give you some great content going forward also. Thank you, Ali. Um, so as usual, I'm the stupid one here. Ali, <laughs> very unqualified to be here. I studied finance and biochemistry at a school called Miami University of Ohio. The Miami Indians are um, and I uh, came to famous probably that I was in the back of an ambulance uh, dealing with nursing home patients for a few years while I was there. And came to Israel for some soul searching 10 years ago and still doing some soul searching. And somewhere along the lines I realized that my, in America I worked at Johnson & Johnson and there wasn't really corporates here yet. And so that meant startups. And Trendlines took a, took a gamble on me to uh, help resuscitate one of their companies. And uh, my father-in-law, who was uh, in the pharma world in, in London, told me I was at 24 then. He said, uh, you're, you're too young for this job. You know, the better you do, the more likely they're gonna fire you. So I, I, I succeeded about like three and a half years in. Uh, we got the company funded, got some great partners for clinical trials and a uh, much better team than me. So, uh, so we, we brought somebody better on. And at that point, we built Imagine Bio uh, with a, a couple of great colleagues of mine, Joe, and Dan Stiegel, if you guys know, and Rick uh, Schottenstein. I think our team's actually grown, we brought a couple of analysts this year. And we found our niche uh, to be working with four multinational companies to really understand how, not just that they can, thankfully they can work with the startups, but how they can and how they can get value, as well as in the business world has to be a win win. Okay, great, thank you guys. All right, you actually sat in the order of my questions. Again, I'm gonna direct one of you to be the lead. I do expect follow-up. I will not stand anything relating to foo-foo buzzwords and whatever. This is a conversation that is supposed to be about the reality. Those of you who know me know that uh, I personally am not a fan of all the buzzwords and hype, so let's speak openly and honestly. Um, my first question is for you, actually, Amy. So you deal quite a lot with your corporate customers. Right? You have a lot of visibility into how they think, but more than that, you have visibility into what is actually working. Right. So the question is, what do you think constitutes, and this is broad on purpose, what do you think constitutes a good business model for a digital health startup? As a startup, you might be surprised when you speak with somebody like me or corporate ventures or innovation or digital health, whatever you know, title they happen to hold, and they say, well, how can you help us? Right? You're like, wait, you're like a big pharma company, you're a big hospital, like, shouldn't you be like telling me what you can do with my product? The answer is, they have no clue. They have no clue because their job is in the ivory tower. 
So every now and then, if you come across a business unit head, and whatever relevant business unit or therapy unit that is, they probably actually know what their problems are. And they, if they happen to meet you, which would be crazy, because why would honor be, would they be talking to startups? They have a day job to do, right? But they would actually understand the issue. So you need to understand better than the big, scary, expensive, rich company, you need to understand better than them what their problems are. And if you don't, don't expect them to. Can you define that a little bit better? Like understanding the problem. What do you really mean by this? So earlier I talked about like adherence, right? So in the drug world, they sell drugs. So most patients, myself included, happen to miss a couple days. On one hand, that means the drug does not work as well, the way that it was tested in clinical trials and defended there. On the other hand, the pharma company likes to get paid. And if I don't fill my prescription at the end of the month, it means they didn't get paid as often as they expected. It's fine, so that's like big adult, but specifically, what kind of drugs does that really make a meaningful difference on, both from a clinical practice and from a business side? And where can a, a niche idea, not every patient who takes this expensive cancer drug or this expensive CNS drug, but the patients who are most likely to not take it, that would be the target audience for an adherence solution. Because if you're gonna need to pay for everybody, suddenly you're all that more expensive and some patients decently take their drugs. So you need to understand who of those target patients, so talking about behavioral issues, are your target audience. And suddenly you become four times more valuable because they're just a quarter of the real patients. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, what <laughs> constitutes a good business for digital health startups? That's a really good question. Um, a good business, what, what let me, let's think about, really what, I mean, for, the question is, is it for the good business for the startup or is it good business for their customer, I guess? Um, I think it has to be good business for everybody involved. So there's a chain in here and you have to think about everybody from the startup through uh, whether you have a distributor or you have a partner, a strategic partner such as Accenture, and then you have a client that actually is actually paying for this and then at the end, there's someone else that could be actually paying for the service that this customer that you're paying for is providing. This was a little complicated. But in this chain, everyone needs to be happy. And for some of them, it has to do with money. With others, it's going to have to do with um, their relationship with their customers. With others, it's going to be about uh, clinical data. So you just have to make sure in that chain that everybody's happy and that you're thinking of them. You have to get into their head and say, if I were X, what would be interesting to me? So same as what Ilya said, where you say you're coming to them and they're, you, know, you have to explain to them how you're making their life easier. How are you making money for them? Um, and I have to say all of these big corporates that everybody's looking at say, oh, they have so much money. They're trying to find ways to make more money. That is everything that they're doing has to be with how are we going to be more efficient or make more money because they're gonna go away if they don't make more money. And that's, I mean, it's terrible, but this is what they have to do. This is why they're so large and we're so small. So you have to remember that and, and kind of get over that a little bit and think how am I going to make something good for them. And obviously, and I have to say, fortunately, we're in healthcare and, and life sciences, we're going to make better for humanity and for patients. But in that process, the business is super important and you can't disregard it. I, it's a good question. And I think it's one that, the thing is you have to really stop and define what it means because um, you, I think everyone here would agree that uh, health, digital health is undergoing this whole process of realigning uh, accountability and roles for providers and finding new ways to engage uh, empower pa consumers, patients, individuals, or school close enough people. Um, so there's really no one size fits all, and there's so much variability in the space that you can't really generalize and say this is the right way to build a business model. It really depends on you know the, the context. But I think and I, I can and I think. I agree with what you said, I just want to point a little more. It's all about aligning incentives, and I think Ilya mentioned that as well uh, in his own way. It's all about finding the way to, to make everyone happy in this chain of kind of, within all the relevant stakeholders. 
um, and, and mostly just have uh, a model that's easily measurable because that's often where a lot of startups fail uh, early on, even though uh, they have the big potential to become bigger companies if they would have just done a better job of finding a, a business model that's uh, easily measurable. So I tend to agree. I, I think the variability comes from the various disparate players in healthcare, but what Gali said is exactly right. A good business model understands every single entity within the value chain and can understand how every single one of them will be made happier. I 100% agree. And the variability comes because there's no template. So I'll give you an example because I know you're going to ask that. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I've seen a lot of companies that uh, come and you said something about that, and I actually disagree with what you said. Uh, you said you should uh, improve outcome, lower the cost, that's it, basically. You didn't say that, but, but that was like the, the takeaway for me, and I think um, that's not always the case. If, if we think about the money incentives, if a doctor gets a, a solution nowadays and they think, uh, even if it's, it gets their outcomes, it, spend less time in the OR, let's take a very specific example, lowers the time, uh, better outcome, lower cost. If they get reimbursed for a lower amount than they would have without that solution, it, it, it's a number. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna be integrated. They're not gonna use it. And uh, you're gonna have to find other ways to get into the hospital and make them, you know, top down, kind of use it and have the payer force them to use it. Otherwise, they won't be, get reimbursed. So that's one example where aligning all incentives is very, very important because the hospital wants it, the payer may want it. Uh, not enough, but they're incentivized to want it. If the doctor is not incentivized to, to use it, then things go. So I want to actually keep going with you. We'll get back to you in a second. So like, uh, you said, <laughs> I, we're very late, so I'm speeding things up. Sorry, you have questions. So uh, I think Nadav, you spend all of your days assessing and looking at startups, and you've probably seen more startups in digital health and digital than anyone else, I would venture to guess. Um, I personally think that there are turning issues with them from a business perspective. Can you highlight for us the top two, three recurring problems you see with the business aspects of digital health startups in Israel? I'll give you a few at the top of my head, and then I'm gonna give the mic to someone else and think about a few others. Um, so I think the first one is uh, validating your model, your everything, validating your solution, your business model with the, the user, offering clinicians, rather than the person actually paying for it. Uh, so I, oftentimes I see companies coming in and saying, yeah, we validated it with 10 different clinicians, and that's, uh, sorry, that was actually, never mind. Uh, so that, that, that's not, that's not, it can't work. I mean, the doctor's not the person paying for it. They're very, very, Rarely the same person, the guy paying for your solution, the guy using it uh, at the end of the day. So that's one thing that I, uh, that I often see. Another one is actually overlooking policy. Um, we don't have policies in Israel, is, it's here, it exists, but it's not as prominent as it is in the US. And uh, especially now when you see a lot of different uh, changes to the policy in the US, and uh, we actually one of our team members is a, is a former uh, a member of the, the American administration, and she was actually responsible for health policies. And when you really get to know the nuances that they, they work with, it, it affects uh, a lot of things, if not now, then down the road. Uh, so definitely something that, that, that's been overlooked. Um, I'll keep thinking about other ones. So I'll start with an obvious, using too many buzzwords. Maybe it's on your bingo, but you know, saying, we use this complicated deep neural network, and we have an AUC of uh, this and that, and, and it's a prediction model utilizing blah, 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 blah. Platform. I mean, when the conversation starts with this pitch, I go numb, really. Um, so that's an obvious, I guess. Um, but I guess most companies fail because they're not First of all, laser focused on what they want to do. It's too broad. I mean, I think I, I mean, I really like Healthy.io. I mean, Jonathan is brilliant. And I think what 
made his journey really magical that from the very first moment, moment sorry, he was focused on his mission and he constantly tried to re redefine and challenge himself and his team about what exactly they want to do. And they did a lot of work around customer journey, a lot, and defining where exactly do they fit into the market and how should they penetrate the market. And asking themselves again and again and again, are we, do we have the answer? And when they were not satisfied, they keep on pushing. So being laser focused and not too broad. I have to agree, Hildeo was one of the few companies here in Israel that I think really understood every single touch point along the system and how every single one of them could benefit. Yeah, maybe. Oh. No, no, go ahead. About no, it's about, I mean, it's, it's about, about failure. Specific, no, specifically about Hildeo, it's not just that. They also found a market that needed what they were offering, they didn't go to the US, they went to the UK, where you have to wait for a week to actually get a lab, uh, you know, to be able to get into a lab, and the direct-to-consumer home-based laboratory is now something that's very common. So I don't think anybody knows this, because we're not from the UK, maybe they all we don't know. Um, but, but that's the thing, they found, they found the right market. That's another thing, you can't, you know, the whole, I lived in the US and then there's all these statistics about US, 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 US. It's one system and it so might not be right. If I translate it back, yes. you're saying one of the failures in Israel is the mismatch to the market? Is sometimes, well, not understanding your market and sometimes not understanding that the US might not be your market. Um, and again, this really, it's, it's a, I can't generalize because every product is different and of course a lot, the US has a lot of similarities to, the, to Israel and I understand why you would look at the US but sometimes your product is right for a different market so make sure you understand that. Um, I, I actually want to say, and, and to answer that question, I have to say something, I might be shooting myself in the foot because we know that Israelis think they're the best thing ever but I have to say that I've been looking at startups outside of Israel and they don't have half the knowledge that Israeli startups have about business and ecosystem. I talk to startups and I say to them, okay, so have you registered IP? And they're like, oh no, it's not possible to register an IP for an algorithm. So there is knowledge here that's exceptional. There is understanding that there are use cases beyond what you have here because we have no market here. There are huge advantages to Israeli startups. That said, look up the word, you, the, not a word, it's a, use case, find out what a use case is and when you're talking to larger companies, use that word because everybody, every small startup that has no idea what they're doing in the US explains to me what their use case is and every single startup in Israel I talk to does not use that at all. So that's you know my two cents. I wanna challenge you. I heard this uh, really good saying, uh, actually came back from Jerusalem from the conference. Uh, so from one of the speakers in a private talk, it was like, yeah, you Israelis, uh, you invented a new type of grammar. You use present, future, progressive. We have a product that will. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, be transparent on your product is really crucial when you're pitching it, right? Um, and we Israelis tend to think that, you know, kombina and, uh, you know, everything will fall into the right place is like, uh, you know, acceptable, and in certain places around the world is not, right? I have to know who said that. <laughs> and, um, he said it back in the Shiva conference in June as well. Exactly. <laughs> exactly, Halamka. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have an endless, long, papyrus scroll of issues that I have, <laughs> so we're not gonna get into me. I'm gonna go to the next question, a totally different topic. But we hear all the time about Israel health data, the data is amazing, the health data, the da, 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 great. Data is only viable if you can access it and if you can integrate to it, right? Um, and I actually wanted to ask you guys, because Accenture deals a lot with the infrastructure of data and transfer. So this question is like a fool but a fool. Do you think a digital health startup can succeed without data? Or what's the role of data in the actual success of a digital health startup? 
Um, I think data is a, a model that has to do with the value of the company. So with many startups, they have used data to say, my company is valuable because I collect data and I can do X to data. So data in itself is not valuable. Um, the fact that you trained your algorithm on a data set is great. When you go to a customer, they're going to want to train your algorithm on their data set. So it's not about the data. Um, it is about interoper interoperability. It is about accessing the systems. It's about being able to have an API. It's about being able to plug into the large systems to an ERP and a SAP and, uh, and, uh, and a Microsoft Azure. You have to know that. Um, a lot more than data. It's, it's really not about data. I do think that what distinguish it, distinguishes a digital health startup from a non-digital health startup is data. I mean, it has to have a data component um, to, to answer Elia's question about what is digital health. Anything that touches health that has anything to do with data, to me, is digital health. That's, that's how I see it. But the data is not your product. So uh, I tend to divide into clinical and not clinical in very, very broad ways, right? Clinical stuff requires the data as an essential portion of the validation. Right? And that's, as you said, it's quite the difference between the data that I'm working on to get the initial validation as opposed to someone else's data thing. There's a wide amount, especially outside of Israel, of successes in digital health that are non-clinical, where that's where I see the data as an output of that product, right? If that, if that product can generate actionable proprietary data, self-generated, that's very valuable. But the, the stuff that's not clinical for me does not need data as a prerequisite for success. You want to say something? Uh, I always want to say something. That's like my constant thing. Uh, I'm gonna be annoying again and take a step back and say uh, we've become, become, become accustomed to uh, to hearing data as a new oil, so automatically it's like digital health is data, not necessarily. I mean, take PillPack, for example, no data related. I mean, they have, it's an operational play. Data is almost irrelevant uh, when it comes to their business model and how they use data. So... That won't be asked now is lack of access to the data. Uh, we'll call it a fiasco, but yeah, let's say it's a disadvantage. We've been asked how important is data. So the, the short answer is it's important. I'll be the first to admit it because that's where I come from. Uh, but the longer answer, I think, is it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, because, like you already mentioned, uh, there's clinical, there's non-clinical, there's just operational. Um, and, and for some startups, will be okay with 70% accuracy because right now all the, the their customers have is 50 percent, so that's way better. But if you're a clinical algorithm, you need to keep like 95 percent up. That's a different kind of challenge. It's, then you, you start thinking about what Gary said about access to data. If it's longitudinal, if it's temporal, if it's identifiable, if it's uh, how many data sources are there? Can you fuse them together? Uh, it's a regression problem. It's a classification problem. It's a classroom problem. A lot of different questions that have to do with data. So. I think the longer answer is really depends on what you're trying to achieve, uh, but it does give you, a, it, it's, it's a hump you, get, you have to get, get over. Uh, that's actually one of the reasons we, uh, we partnered with Chiba, that we, we saw a lot of startups struggling with getting access to data, and Chiba has 4.5 4. million, I'll give it to you in a minute, uh, entries that uh, our startups and other startups as well, that any one of you can, can access. Uh, and that's one thing we, we hoped would uh, solve that hump, the, when you, you become a bigger company like Urans, for example, if any of you are following voice tech and describing uh, companies in the space, I've seen, I think, 20 different scrubbing companies over the last two months. I don't think any of them stand any chance against Urans because they just have way more data. I mean, it doesn't matter if they, if as a startup I can get the weights that are already being trained, it doesn't matter because if it's successful, Urans is going to be there first. So I think in short, like Nadal said, the answer is yes. Um, in two words, it's short but. It's a yes but. Um, and I would say most of the data in healthcare is crap. 
and most of the companies which relies on data soon are soon to find that you know garbage in garbage out right there are a lot of work um, around curating the data labeling the data making sense out of the data a lot of companies think that you just give me access to your data as, a, as an HMO or you know, health organization and I'll, and I'll be fine and there can be you know they can't be wrong than, than that um, there is a lot of work around the data so that's one. Second of all, um, I share your opinion about proprietary data sources, you know, creating your own data. Um, the more you can do that, we talked about Tempest outside. I think what Tempest are doing is, is incredible. They are really visionary. Um, so, so if you succeed to create your own data pool, your own isolated data pool, which, which uh, make you resilient against competitors, that, uh, that, that's a great thing. Um, and third of all, there are great companies which succeed without data. Um, Health AO, if you want to you know, mention an example which we've uh, mentioned. So I want to throw a curveball in there with the data question, which is, so we're almost certainly dealing with geographies like Israel or Europe or America where the data actually exists. So let's throw in two other great markets. One's called Japan, it's like their biggest go-go economy, and one's called Australia. A little bit smaller, so they speak English there, if you can understand it. Okay, so Japan, there's never been a diaspora there, basically other than like half a year or so, so we don't really have that many relationships out in Japan. Yet still, the Japanese are coming, and they're super enamored by Israel. And yet, if you're familiar with Japan, because of their own regulations today, they basically do not have even electronic medical records for all intents and purposes. They don't have data. Okay, so how do you offer value there? So the answer is almost like the Africa thing. So Africa never got landlines, they probably never will get landlines, they're too expensive. They went straight to cell phones, straight to smartphones. So actually any of you who are used to just saying, hey, well, here's the value of what I can give you with your data, if you have a, a discussion with the Japanese player, you're also collecting the data, you're organizing data because they don't have it yet, okay? And you're working with them within the cracks that are forming in the dam of regulation of allowing data to be gathered and transferred. Australia. They were making fun of the conference at how Australia is moving to the wonderful fax machine for gathering their data, okay? It's amazing, there's a huge network of fax machines out there, still a great network effect, right? And so if you put all of your data into the fax machine, great, you're gonna come out with the same data on the other side, and it's totally unorganized. Okay, that's the reality there. This is exciting plans in Australia. It's a little bit better than that, but not much. And so they're similar. If you can help them organize their data, they don't have it, right? That you have to almost get over what we're used to being the norm. So if you can prove it here, you can prove it in the US markets, suddenly you can go there and, and help them jump forward 10 years. Maybe just to add one more thing regarding data. Uh, what we have discovered in the research institute, uh, I'm in part, I haven't mentioned uh, the Clarit as a research institute. It, it's been running for more than a decade now, um, developing really cool stuff. Uh, I invite you to read if you are not familiar with the things we have done. For example, there was a really good publication in Nature about a week ago. Um, and one thing we have learned, we, actually we learned a couple of things regarding data, but one thing we have learned that, you know, to develop a good model, eventually you will need really limited amount of features. I mean, you don't need a huge amount of data. Um, it might help at the beginning. But eventually, if you succeed, and you can succeed developing a model based on just a limited amount of features, you'll be able to work with other markets because then you won't need this you know, huge amount of data and really sophisticated system. You will be able to sell not just to the Mayo clinics and the Cleveland clinics, but also to the medium-sized clinics, which are the actual market in the United States and not this center of excellence. I'm gonna keep going with you. Okay, so you have any unique visibility that none of us have have here because you actually work in a healthcare organization, right? And you're actual a medical doctor. No offense, my dad. Um, so you have visibility to other aspects of digital health as a business, specifically regulation, process, workflow, bureaucracy, all of these things, administration, operation, etc. Um, can you highlight for us maybe one or two really the most critical aspects beyond just money, that are the most relevant for the success of any digital health startup in Israel? I will start with time. Not 
expected answer. Good. Keep going. Um, one thing I've learned um, throughout uh, my tenure in Clolit, and, and also because I, I've established a community for uh, 8-1, the Intelligence Core Technological Unit alumni uh, in healthcare. And uh, the reason I've started this community is because I got these uh, phone calls from entrepreneurs doing something in cyber and data, and now they think, you know, healthcare is the next step because I have the capabilities, right? And maybe I can do something meaningful altogether. But the thing is, you know, because of the, all those new technologies become relevant to healthcare, it's not, you know, devices 10 years ago, we see a lot of entrepreneurs that don't really know the healthcare system on its downsides, on its uh, walls, on its bureaucracy, on its limitations. And you have to set your expectations. I mean, you won't get access to our EMR data within a week. Okay, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you get my point, okay? So, um, deducing that to time is really crucial. I mean, you have to understand that those things, these things, sorry, takes time, take time. Um, that's one. And, and first, and second of all, I'm not sure everyone are really are, are fully aware to the regulations. I mean, we, we are bounded with you know the Ministry of Health regulations, with our internal regulations, with GDPR, HIPAA whatever. I mean, there, there are so many circles around this issue of regulations and, and it really resonates with the theme of time, but, but it's another theme altogether. Okay. Alright, so, <laughs> so this is going to be my last question before we open it up to you, and this is a question for everybody. Um, and I'm going to answer this as well, I'll go last. Um, so the question is this, where do you think are some of the most interesting business opportunities for startups in digital health in Israel. You can go first. Me. Life sciences, <laughs> pharma, and med tech. They're looking for solutions that are going to make to be game changers. You're all really focused on healthcare systems, and they don't have money. Sorry, they're not accessible. They're really difficult to work with. I haven't seen exceptional, amazing companies in the life sciences and med tech spaces for digital health. Um, and I think there's huge potential there. Um, and it's not about the data, it's about finding something that creates value for them. They need access to their patients, they need access to healthy people. Um, they, they need so many things, they don't even know what they need. And there's some brilliant minds here that are very creative. I think that's to me, is a huge potential for business-wise. So first off, 100% agree. Uh, though I want to put an important caveat out there, uh, my colleague Dan, uh, who back in his days at EY, worked to actually found the digital health strategies of many of the top pharma companies, has taught me that when we speak with the startups in the room here, on behalf of one of our pharma companies, we now say very openly, please be aware just how slow they are at making the decision me because I have access to the pharma companies and don't go directly to them, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be an here. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I wouldn't say I disagree completely because I did see an uptick, uptick in, uh, in the number of pharma companies uh, that are willing to pay for digital solutions. I feel like at this point in time, I'm not sure how long this is going to uh, remain so their, their appetite is kind of, uh, they're waiting for the, the, the technologies they already integrated to, to, to show them value. And I don't think they're seeing enough of it at the moment. Uh, but it is, it is, I'll agree it's way better than uh, turning to providers because uh, well, it's the same cell cycle but you get uh, a, a 10 times bigger success at the end of it. Uh, so definitely a more scalable model. I would, if we're talking about who I think startups should be uh, targeting at, at this point, I think it's mostly payers, employers. Uh, with digital health changing, economics are changing as well, and there are going to be a lot of challenges in those spaces and, and little arbitrages that uh, startups can take advantage of. Uh, you spoke about Telemed earlier, that's one of our portfolio companies doing an amazing job uh, at that. Um, and just maybe a word about Sulik was. Uh, in Oh, yeah, okay, that's, that's, that's important. Uh, not, not intelligence unit, myself. Uh, but go away one. Uh, 
so he, he came from a semiconductor, knew nothing about healthcare, and now he knows more about healthcare and the, the different economics than I think most. I did. <laughs> Is there anyone here from Anthem? Most Anthem people. Um, so, so that's one one space, I think. Another one is uh, patient engagement. I'm not going to dive too deep into that because I think you're all aware of different uh, uh, attempts on, on that front. Um, yeah, I think that, that's, that's my list. So I think I'll, I'll go with moonshots. I mean, we, we see too many incremental solutions, too many similar wearables, forgive me all the wearable companies, um, too many things that will make your life a bit easier, make your life a bit better. Um, I mean, we have the best and brightest here, right? We, we uh, tend to take pride in our, you know, in our, I don't know, intelligence core units, they ate something, and then uh, the universities, etc., etc. But you see so many companies that are doing, you know, those, uh, taking this small step. And I mean, it's not easy taking a big risk. And, and to create a moonshot, you have to, to raise a lot of money. But I think these days, uh, the money is available, either here or abroad. I mean, we have someone sitting from a moon within us. Um, just, just as an example, but I mean, I don't know, so. Um, but you know, throughout the audience, there are you know representative here from big corporates. I won't name them. Um, but anyhow, you can raise the money, but you just need to be bold enough. Um, there's crazy companies sitting in the West Coast, for example, and they're led by you know similar people. Um, so take a moonshot and not present just another solution. More challenging. <laughs> I haven't um, spoken yet, I'm last. I'm just, I wouldn't give you the, the opportunity. Uh, so I agree, especially as a VC. Um, I've seen a lot of good companies that I want to invest in, I think would be successful, just not for a VC. Uh, if you're not familiar with tomorrow, I'll be happy to explain. Um, but, okay, moonshots is good. What kind of moonshots would you say are more, most likely to succeed? So uh, I'm a big believer in the crosses in graphs, the one where you see technology is becoming cheaper and the demand or, or I don't know, the willingness to do something is increasing. Um, I can give you know, a few examples, but you know, utilizing compute the, you know, the available computing power, the available um, data resources, the available um, convergence of different industries, into like those, these three elements and then combine them into really interesting companies. Um, Pillback is one example. I think Pillback is a good example for a moonshot. I mean, they were crazy, but then they were sold to Amazon only when having 30,000 clients, something like that, operating for three years. Um, but uh, Novozymes, for example, uh, for another example, doing liquid biopsy for colon cancer. They really analyze the entire circle, um, and they raised they raised a lot of money, right? That's a great example. I'm actually a very big believer in liquid biopsies. So Novozymes, and I think you know, Novozymes could have been established here. Uh, there is no reason why, and their their investor is actually Israeli, sitting in the West Coast. But nevertheless, let me throw a quick uh, corkscrew in there, and I'll hand it over. So. Unfortunately for the investors in the room, the answer that I have is not fitting for that. It's not a VC answer. There are great opportunities out there that don't actually need investment. There are things out there that are already approved. Okay, one of the, there's a lot of things I wish that I hadn't taken my investors into after the fact. There's one that I wish I had pushed harder for, which happened to be a group of Israelis in, in the US who didn't invent anything. They just recognized that a existing technology was not being used for a whole swath of the market. It happened to be the majority of the market that nobody realized was being ignored. So they took an existing approved technology that was off patent, that had amazing, amazing margins, like un unbelievable margins, okay? They didn't do anything fishy. And they just addressed the market that nobody was, uh, was addressing. Now you have to know what those markets are, you have to know what those niches are. But that's, that's a huge op. But I think in, in some cases, it's not a question of technology. It will be a, a question of, um, 
execution. Uh, take Flatiron, for example. Um, I mean, there is not a lot of technology there. Maybe some folks in the company will challenge that, but eventually it was a question of execution. And they were bought by Roche, probably by $2 billion, I guess. I mean, can't argue with that. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize this because it kind of summarizes my thoughts on that. This, and I didn't want to speak on purpose. And I'm gonna be completely honest with all of you and all of you. Um, I see lots and lots and lots of opportunities. Um, I see an extensive amount of misalignment of knowledge, not just from startups, but also from a lot of the investing community as well, who supports and continues to support this misalignment. So I'm gonna start off my monologue with a short example. I gave a lecture just about this uh, to all of the startups dealing with health in Jerusalem. Uh, it was mass challenge, people from buy a house, from, you know, they had the Amazon, blah, blah. and I asked a simple question. I said, how many of you here are going to sell your data to insurance? And two thirds of the hands were up. And I said to all the founders there, I said, every single one of you is incorrect. Until you understand the economics of why an insurance company would even bother buying your data, there's no point claiming I'm gonna sell data to insurance. So my point is, and I have three, and you're gonna bear with me, because I bear with you. The first is that understanding the economic motivation between all the healthcare actors is critical, and once you get that, you can also find opportunities. For example, I see quite a lot of opportunities with ASCs in the United States, Tom's, significantly more so than hospitals, simply because the operational and organizational structure of an ASC is different from a hospital, which creates economic opportunities. ASC, Ambulatory Service Center, outsource day in, day out operations, right? Next thing is the corporate aspect, right? Which I agree with you on this. And the corporate aspect is significantly bigger than what people think, uh, especially in our little bubble in Israel. You're gonna win. <laughs> because there's a huge amount of conversion. He wants to be in line. There's a huge amount of convergence between tech players, traditional healthcare players, digital health, uh, and it's really fascinating at the same time, kind of overwhelming. I'll give you an example. There are about 95 acquisitions in Europe that I would classify as traditional digital health startup. That's it, from 2015 till today, about 95. Those 95 acquisitions came from 85 different investing and acquiring entities. None of them are brand name. I saw the list and I did not recognize a single one of the companies. Not Apple, not Google, not Pfizer, not this, none of them. So the activity is coming from radically different people. There's lots of opportunity and especially for founders to begin conversations at an earlier stage with these corporate players. Of course, you have to time it out accordingly. There's a lot of opportunity and it's much bigger than we think. The third aspect, and I agree with that, is the question of policy. Policy, and I don't mean like, oh, FDA is gonna change this, or CMARC's gonna be this, or that, whatever. Na Digital health as a national policy offers an unbelievable amount of insight into where these opportunities are. For example, uh, the assembly bill in California last week, changing uh, people who are freelance for gig economy to full-time employees, this is gonna directly affect the bottom line of Science 37, City Block Health, a couple startups in Israel who rely on gig economy, because eventually it's gonna go through the entire United States, and every one of them will never hold up their PL. Another great example is the Digital Health Act from Germany two months ago. Unbelievably fascinating. The act says something specific. It says that by law in Germany, a doctor can prescribe a digital health whatever therapy. It also says that insurance must reimburse for that policy. Unbelievably fascinating, right? This creates an unbelievable twist in the dynamic of who you can sell to in Germany, right? It also says that if you can't prove efficacy after a year, you're out. So understanding that dynamic shows a lot of opportunity. There's a reason why value-based value-based care plays will have a better chance of success in France than they will in the United States. There's a reason why all everybody comes to me with a VR play, I immediately tell them to go to Spain. And this is stuff that is actually policy-based. So at the end of the day, when I think about opportunities for you guys, 
Bone up on who's paying for what and why, primarily. Bone up on how the corporate landscape is shaking out in health because it's overwhelming and it's unbelievably hard to track. Uh, and a lot of it's stuff that's internal. Like there's a huge difference between how Boston Scientific in Israel deals with digital health and how Medtronic in Israel deals with digital health than how MSD, than how Procter & Gamble, than how GE, than whatever, even companies that compete with each other have different incentives. It's really hard to tease out what that is, but open your eyes to it, a lot of opportunity. And the third is to track policy. Policy really gives you an indication of what's going on and where at a national level money is going to be flowing. So that's the last point. I really want to open this up. Nobody won the bingo? Okay, so hopefully we have time for a couple questions. But, sorry, but one of the surprising things that you guys didn't raise was the importance of patients. Was the importance of patients and patient groups and the forces that they can do when they want a product. And what I want to do is to hold you there because we've got two startups. Let's hear the two startups, and then we can perhaps get your reaction. So first of all, let's start with uh, Gamma and Skype and Scalable who uh, last week, uh, or two weeks ago, won the MedTech. And uh, let's see where they're going and what you think about that. 